Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at NASA Kennedy Space Center's Launch Pad 39A. The STS-130 crew is here for their terminal countdown demonstration test and would like to answer a few questions. It's my pleasure to introduce the commander of Space Shuttle Endeavor, Commander George Zamka. Thanks, Andrea. Boy, good morning. Great to see you all. Another great morning here at the Kennedy Space Center. We've had a great trip so far. Uh, today, as you uh, can see, we're here uh, at the launch pad and we're going to do some um, emergency drill uh, training today just so we don't have to worry about uh, things on launch day. And we're ready to take any questions that you have. Hi, good morning. I'm James Dean from Florida today. Um, good morning. You guys are are uh, kicking off what obviously could be a historic year for the program. Um, first of the last five flights, if uh, things fly out on time this year, and finishing station assembly. So I'm just wondering how much, uh, for Colonel Zamka or wh whomever would like to comment, how, how much is that on your mind as you prepare for your final flight and um, one of the last uh, major construction missions for the station? James, I think I'm going to give that to our, our senior veteran flyer, Steve Robinson. Thanks, I think. <laughs> you know, we're, we're thinking about STS-130 every minute of every day. But it occurs to me, having worked on the space shuttle a really long time, um, that when we come back, the reality of what this year really means to the space shuttle program is going to kind of set in. And it's bittersweet. You know, we all love the shuttle. Look at that grand thing. Look what human beings can do. And, uh, <clears throat> but you know what? The history of space uh, travel has shown that when one program ends, the next program is even more exciting and more motivating and more compelling to go into the future than the one before it. And we, tr we don't know exactly what's going to happen after the shuttle, but we do believe that's going to be the case. Uh, for, for Kay, um, you have strong ties to this community, as you said, when you arrived, um, still considering Merritt Island one of your homes. So just wondered if you could talk about the excitement of returning again as an astronaut preparing to fly into space and but also at a fairly difficult time as you know for the center and the community where uh, I imagine many people that that you may know uh, many of the people who work here uh, could face layoffs uh, as, as the program winds down. Oh yeah uh, it is great to be back it uh, feels like I'm coming home I uh, see so many familiar faces and I just feel so fortunate to have this experience to come from the workforce at the Kennedy Space Center and knowing the people that work here and also just what it takes to process this fantastic vehicle to be able to put it into space and conduct the complicated missions that, that we're able to perform with this. Uh, so it's just such a, a fantastic experience for me to be able to see the other end of it, the uh, portion of being able to fly this vehicle. And uh, yeah, we know there's obviously changes coming, and uh, I know there are a lot of concerns among the workforce, but uh, these folks are strong and they believe in space and space exploration, and they're gonna be here to support whatever programs are, are gonna follow on. So uh, I know a lot of folks are concerned, but uh, I think that everything will work out just fine. Justin Ray with uh, SpaceFlightNow.com. Uh, I guess for the commander, what is your confidence level that the new ammonia hoses are going to be ready in time for you guys to to go launch on February 7th and, and, and to do a full duration flight? Oh, wow, great question. Uh, let me hand that to our lead spacewalker, Bob Benkin. That is a great question, and we've been kind of following these ammonia lines and the story associated with them for uh, 13 months. I think... Uh, uh, folks who are paying close attention right now uh, haven't really heard the entire story. So we've been we've been watching them closely for a, a long time now. Uh, last weekend, our crew was up to uh, Huntsville uh, at Marshall, actually getting a chance to see the first line as it was uh, coming together and actually put it on a test rig to make sure that it was going to do the job that it was uh, intended. We're expecting this Saturday to fly up and see all four lines in a uh, pretty good configuration, pretty flight representative. Um, and those lines after that will actually come down here to the KSC Space Center for uh, 
for processing and, and installation into the orbiter. And so right now the schedule appears for that set of lines to be a couple of days ahead. Um, our original plan was to do our uh, fit check and our opportunity with them next weekend, but they're, uh, they're ahead now and we'll be able to do that this Saturday, which is uh, great news. As you, uh, you may know, the program's also pursuing a second set of lines that would allow us to uh, uh, launch at a slightly, slightly delayed uh, launch date with a full full capability for node 3. So the program's pursuing two courses, but uh, plan one that we're moving forward with right now is actually ahead of schedule. Like I said, giving us that chance to do a fit check a, a week early, and uh, that's really good news as we uh, move forward to flight. Uh, while you got the, the microphone, can you just sort of give us a snapshot of each of your three EVAs? And, and, and also, as part of that, has any of your content changed given the, the changes in the, in the ammonia jumpers? Yeah, those are both uh, uh, Good, good questions to ask. The, the first one, kind of the official content for our flight has been relatively fixed. Um, that's one of the nice things about uh, bringing a new module and uh, a big construction flight to the uh, space station. If we're bringing Node 3, our EVAs are probably going to entail uh, taking care of Node 3 and getting it on board the, uh, the space station. So our first spacewalk will uh, involve uh, Nick Patrick and I heading out to the shuttle payload bay and basically unhooking Node 3 and getting it uh, configured so that it'll be ready to attach to the space station. So that's what we'll focus on for our, the beginning of uh, our first spacewalk. The end of the first spacewalk will entail uh, hooking up power to that module so that it will be able to you know, have heaters and things. Uh, those are the same things that we'll be disconnecting from the uh, payload bay. We'll be hooking up when it actually gets on board the space station for the first spacewalk. The second spacewalk is going to focus on getting the cooling system, those ammonia lines that uh, you referred to in your previous question, hooked up onto Node 3 and connecting it into the, the lab uh, thermal control system so that we'll, we'll actually have cooling and allow Node 3 to be activated uh, and come all the way up to, to full operation uh, at the end of uh, EVA 2. For EVA 3, we're going to focus on uh, a little bit more outfitting on uh, Node 3, get the second cooling loop for redundancy uh, squared away on it, and uh, Nick will actually release the launch locks on the uh, cupola window. So we, uh, we hope to have the cupola relocated between EVA 2 and EVA 3, and then on EVA 3, when Nick uh, opens those launch locks, be able to open the windows and complete the outfitting of all three of those, uh, all three of those modules. Steve Wood, um, online aviation magazine, aviatemagazine.com. A question regarding the uh, shuttle itself, a little bit basic. How many of you are trained to fly the shuttle? And what sort of training did you undertake and how did it go? I think, uh, let me give that to Terry. It's yeah. a good question. Um, well, if we're flying the shuttle, uh, there's several different phases of flight. The shuttle starts out as a rocket. And uh, during the launch phase, uh, the commander, Colonel Zamka, and myself are both trained to fly it manually. Um, normally, the computers fly it for the ascent, but, but we can take over and fly it if something went wrong. And then there's the orbital phase when the shuttle turns into a spaceship. And uh, again, uh, Colonel Zamka and I will both be doing different uh, maneuvering burns, we call them in space, to speed up or slow down, to do a rendezvous with the station, or to point the shuttle in different attitudes. Um, to keep the sun at the right angle, or there's different needs that we have for different maneuvering in space. So we, we both do those, and uh, actually all of the mission specialists on, on the flight uh, at times will get involved in maneuvering the shuttle too, so we're all familiar with that. And then the third phase, the shuttle turns into an airplane for landing, and uh, again, the commander and pilot both do uh, a lot of training for that. The last two nights we've been practicing landing here at the shuttle landing facility, in the shuttle training aircraft and so uh, we've gotten lots and lots of practice dives to get ready for the landing day so there's kind of three different ways of flying and that's how that's broken down okay talking about landing uh, it's a long runway in terms of a conventional aircraft but it's pretty short i guess in terms of the shuttle what sort of aircraft do you use for training the airplane that we have is a modified gulfstream 2 it's a about a medium-sized business jet and it has uh, special thrust reversers uh, on the engines that allow uh, them to deploy in flight. So the engines are actually running in reverse to provide a lot of drag because the shuttle dives at a very steep angle, about 20 degrees, as compared to the conventional airliner is only 3 degrees. So it's a much steeper, it's more like a dive bombing pattern in a fighter jet than it is a, a normal airplane approach. And the airplane also has a computer controlled system that makes it fly like a shuttle, which is a lot different than a normal airplane. So that's the the airplane and the training that we use. And the runway is very long. It's about three miles long, even longer with that with overruns here.
but we do land a lot faster than normal air airliners, so it's nice to have that long piece of concrete in front of us. Just a quick one for Nicholas. I notice you're interested in flying yourself. What do you fly in the, in the UK? I, uh, <clears throat> I learned to fly in the Royal Air Force Volunteer Reserve at university, a British Aerospace, a British Aerospace Bulldog, T Mark I. Um, I came back uh, to the States uh, to grad school, and uh, obviously I've stayed here ever since. And uh, uh, before I uh, got assigned to this flight, I used to spend time as a flight instructor, and I like to fly uh, all kinds of light aircraft and helicopters, anything I can, really. Um, Chris Gebhardt with NASASpaceflight.com with uh, one for Terry, I believe. Um, could you describe some of the robotics operations that are going to be used on this mission in terms of getting the node and uh, cupola into their correct positions? Sure, there's a, a lot of robotics going on on the flight, and actually everybody on the crew will be doing parts of them at times. Um, we use the shuttle arm mainly for inspection, so we'll grab the, the boom and use that to inspect the shuttle uh, before we dock and after we undock. The, the main meat of the robotics, once we, once we are docked, we'll be using the station arm, the SSRMS, first of all, to grab node three during the first spacewalk. Um, Kay and I are doing a, a lot of the station arm work together. We're going to grab node three, pull it out of the shuttle payload bay, and attach it to the side, the left side or the port side of the station. Uh, and then we're going to use uh, the same arm on a different day to grab the cupola, which is launched on the end of node three. And it has to be launched there because that's the only way that it fits in the shuttle payload bay. We're going to take it off the end of the node and then attach it to the bottom of the node. So it'll be facing the Earth, and it'll also have a good view of most of the station. Um, and then later in the flight, Bob and Nick are going to take th that same arm, the big station arm, and grab what's called PMA-3. It's an, uh, an adapter that allows the shuttle to dock to the station. It's one of our three PMAs. They're going to um, grab that and move it. So those are the main station robotic operations that we're doing. Um, and for the entire crew, what sort of uh, in-flight experiments are you going to be doing on this flight? In-flight experiments at Bob or Nick? Terry's one. Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, we've got the well. Let me let me give this to Bob since you're you're handling the NLP. We actually have a, a limited number of payloads on this on this flight. We actually have a uh, cells and viruses experiment uh, that will will launch in the uh, mid deck. Uh, we actually won't have it powered, so we won't be taking care of cells on the on the way uphill. We'll swap that uh, apparatus out with one that's on board the space station. Nick's actually going to perform that uh, swap out to provide them with a, a new uh, incubator, if you will, to have on orbit on the on the space station. We're also going to be flying a, a freezer. A, a glacier is the uh, payload name, so as you can imagine, it's probably pretty cold on the inside. But uh, we'll be flying that up uh, with with some samples inside, um, in a uh, also in a cold bag that will get transferred over to the uh, space station. Then we'll bring back some frozen biological samples from the uh, the station crew, primarily uh, medical uh, data that's been collected on the on the crew members themselves. Hi, I'm Sandra Frederick from the Washington Times. This question's for Terry. You, um, you mentioned you've spent a lot of time in training, um, but you haven't really seen the shuttle up close. What was your first impression of the Endeavour, and are you flying anything from home? This is a uh, beautiful vehicle. We have a great view here. Um, it's just amazing to, to see the space shuttle. I think what stands out to me is how big it is. Uh, when you walk up to it, it's just such a large vehicle. The external tank, the solid rocket boosters, um, it's amazing to think of that vehicle weighing, uh, you know, almost four million pounds. It, it's just impressive. Um, and yes, I am flying a few things from Maryland. Uh, one of the things is from the Aberdeen Ironbirds. Uh, I've got something from my high school, Oakland Mills High School, a banner from them, and uh, so a few momentum, mementos from Maryland. Um, the next session, uh, question is for Steve. Hi there. You're the veteran on the on the flight, and um, I'm saying that. <laughs> <laughs> the, th <laughs> the three flights that you've been on have been all on Discovery, so you're going on Endeavor for the first time. Uh, is she any different than Dis uh, than Discovery? Yeah, in a way, I'm a. I guess I'm a rookie, aren't I? I'm an Endeavor rookie. Uh, yeah, first time flyer on Endeavor. Um, yeah, I'm all excited to uh, to fly another space shuttle. Um, I haven't uh, seen much of her. Uh, tomorrow I get to climb in. Uh, when she's pretty much in the flight config and, uh, and take a look around. And I'm kind of curious myself to see if I notice any differences between uh, Discovery and Endeavor. But uh, it's amazing that we have even more than one of these things, isn't it? That's all the time we have for questions. If we could have you stand just for a moment for a photo opportunity.
thank you to the STS-130 crew. Have a great day. Enjoy your training.